So it is 7.31 p.m. on November 14th, 2023. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Ben Catholi. Here. Daniel Riccadelli. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam LeBlanc. Here. All right. Welcome to all of you. Um, here on behalf of the town, we have the zoning assistant, Colleen Ralston. Here. Good to have you with us. And our newly appointed town council, Mike Cunningham. Here. Good to have you with us as well. Um, and appearing on docket 3770, 4042 Dorothy Road. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if uh, Erica Schwartz is here or not, but I see Gabrielle Geller is here. Uh, yes, I'm here on behalf of Erica and the Housing Corporation. Perfect. And I see Vika Senti is here as well. Yes. Perfect. Good. Glad to have you both with us. Okay, this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects signed into law on March 29th, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. So the first item on the first several items on the agenda um, relate specifically to the board. And so I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead to the hearings, which brings up item five on our agenda, which is docket 3770-4042 Dorothy Road. So this is a continuance of an existing of a prior hearing, uh, which was on October 24th. At the time we had um, discuss with the applicant certain changes that we thought would be appropriate and uh, helpful in their presentation. And we have received a revised information from the applicant. And so with that, I will turn to, um, to Ms. Geller, if she would like to have, if she has any comments, um, otherwise we'll have the, the architect present the changes. No, I, I think we're okay to go to Vikas. Um, yeah, no, we're, you know, we're excited about this. I get to actually live down the street from this. So I'm personally very <laughs> excited. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. All right, thank you guys again. And for the record, I'm not an architect. Uh, oh, bigger sure that That's reflected. Uh, um, I'm part of the company Reframe Systems. Uh, we've been working with uh, the architect who's revised this version of the design. His name is Andrew McHugh. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's not on the call, but I'll be. I've been we've been working closely with him, so we can represent the views there. Um, if I may share my screen, I can walk the group through um, the changes we're proposing. And I know there's been a few sets of documents on the docket. It should be the last three. Um... You are all set. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you. Okay, just to recap for the audience, we're um, 
referring to um, the parcel at 4042 Dorothy Road. Um, this is a, a, a corner lot at the intersection of Dorothy Road and Parker Street. Parker Street is a private way as it gets into the end where Dorothy is. And we're proposing demolishing this garage, uh, this uh, circle in red, to build uh, passive house zero. So it's a net zero energy ADU. Um, and we'll be utilizing some modern methods of construction. We'll be fabricating a bunch of these components at a factory up in Andover. And we're building this for the housing corp of Arlington. And this will help increase the affordable housing supply uh, in the town of Arlington. Um, uh, would it be helpful to recap where we started, or should I just jump into uh, what we're proposing? I think you can jump into what you're proposing. Okay. So we're, um, we've made significant changes since uh, the last time we were here. Uh, we've since um, considered the, the feedback from the, the zoning board uh, and have um, refactored our, our ADU footprint to be conformant in size and height. So uh, we brought the footprint down to uh, the ADU, uh, subtracting the mechanical room will be 900 square feet and the height is at 20 feet. So we, we comply with, uh, with zoning there. Uh, we also factored in the feedback to bring the front. So because this is a corner lot and we have two front yards, um, we are bringing the front setback uh, to be compliant with existing conditions, which is at 12 feet. Um, so we've updated that change, and um, we're also um, moving the parking spots from our previous proposal uh, and utilizing um, uh, section 61.10.a um, uh, because of uh, the corner lot provision. Uh, we're utilizing the, the language there to propose that we park two spots uh, parallel to the front yard um, as defined in, um, in the zoning bylaw. And uh, our updated request to the zoning board is twofold. Um, one, we've had to, um, let me move to the next screen here, just so we have a closer look. Um, the first request um, is that we uh, be allowed to move the site setback, the existing conditions at five, and five feet and five inches. Uh, our updated request uh, is to have the site setback move to three feet, 10 and a half inches. Um, the property on the other side, there is no other structure uh, in this corner of the lot, so we don't uh, foresee posing any new fire hazards, but we will comply with Massachusetts Building Code and have a one-hour fire-rated wall uh, on, on the side of the ADU. And our second request is to update the rear setback from the lot line. Uh, as it currently exists, the, the garage that exists actually is over the property line by five inches. Uh, we're proposing demolishing that and actually creating uh, um, an average of six foot nine inches of, uh, of a lot line setback, but there will be this portion uh, of the ADU that will be under six feet uh, with the closest point being five feet and a half inch um, and seven feet and one inch on the other end. Um, and uh, to comply with building code, uh, we're actually over the five foot limit. So we, were, we seem to be okay on that end. Um, and um, let, let me pause there and take any questions before we, uh, we go further. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. So Mr. Hanson. No, 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 you please go ahead. I, I can wait. No, go ahead. <clears throat> I was just trying to understand <clears throat> the with respect to the parking uh the provision that you're relying on mr nt is the one that says that uh <clears throat> if you are parking on a paved driveway in a corner lot of less than six thousand square feet which you are um and in the longer of the two front yards which i think you are uh that you can have a driveway uh, of up to a maximum of 24 feet in, in width and park on that. And the idea here is that the two parking spaces that are parallel to the street basically have a width, uh, when you combine them, the width is 24 feet, they're 22 each and their depth is eight feet. So that's why they comply with uh, 6.1.10a. Do I understand that correctly? 
That is right. And the reason we can do this with minimal um, uh, issue to the neighborhood is the um, the curbs already cut previously. Like the, the curb actually ends um, right here uh, on this private way. So we don't pose any further challenges to the, uh, the neighborhood and we seem to comply with the language in the bylaw. Um, so which is why we're, we're suggesting we, we, we proceed with, with that interpretation. So this is basically an eight foot driveway with a 20 foot width, 24 foot width. With a 40, 44 foot width. Uh, 44, 44 foot width. 44. But it's, so we're interpreting the eight foot width as, uh, um, as the width into the property because uh, it doesn't quite specify um, which axis to measure the width against. So we're interpreting it as width okay. into the property and we're keeping it eight foot wide and 44 feet long. Okay, got it. So I had a conversation with the building inspector about on this question. Um, and his his sense is that this is a 44 foot wide driveway because of the way it's oriented. Um, and so I was looking around the site. I had a question. There's a an area on the site here that's identified as a pad. What exactly is that? So um, I don't know, Gabby, if you have more history for it. Uh, if not, I can relay what Eric has relayed to me. Um, sorry, Ma. which part can you? So the concrete pad that's out here. Okay, that's Dorothy. Um, so yeah, those, I mean, I live, it's, I guess it's a concrete pad. I mean, the garage, there's, you know, the property has a fence around both side yards. And then there's this, you know, like a, a you know, pavement, I would, I would say, and then the garage. Um, I don't think there's anything, it, it, if you have something from Erica, I, I mean, I, as far as I know, there's nothing special there. I, I think it's just like a bigger pavement. My, my understanding is that, uh, a previous tenant actually had that pad installed um, and oh. as part of this construction project, uh, HC has requested that we demolish that pad so we create more more green okay. space for the principal building. Um, so oh. uh, that, that should be removed as part of this project. Um, okay. And uh, our plan for the, the parking spots too was to use permeable green pavers. Mm -hmm. So that way it would still look and feel like a green space. Um, and so far only one tenant seems to be using the parking spot. So in general, we, we again expect that we're still preserving at least visually as much green space as possible there. Because okay. what, what I was wanted to ask was, um, so the, the interpretation from inspectional services was that having the two spaces be parallel spaces in this fashion, um, wasn't didn't meet the definition of a 24 foot width um but what i was curious was if sort of there's that corner of the building uh sort of if you're uh, between the pad yeah so in that like if you had two front end spaces at that corner from the corner of the house you could easily you should have plenty, it's more than 18 feet to the corner to the property line so right. you could have two just straight in spaces there and preserve the rest of the site. And that Got would okay. meet the, that would be the width. So if you were amenable to making that change, I think um, inspectional services would accept that change. Got it. Uh, we'll discuss this with HCA. Um, okay. Logistically, we agree that that is a more streamlined solution um, and, and we can update our um, at least when we're going for permitting, we can update um, that aspect of the lot. Um, so I, th I think then, then our question for the, the zoning board uh, would be on the, the two setback special permits requests is, mm -hmm. uh, would you be um, amenable to us increase, like reducing the site setback roughly by one foot and six inches or so on the, on the side and then uh, bringing it uh, between um, roughly, yeah, 11 and a half so, inches to for one portion of the rear setback. So the side yard setback, that is certainly within mass general law because the 
the it's already an unconforming side yard setback. And so the board by special permit can um, allow a reduction in that so long as it doesn't create a condition that is um, significantly more detrimental to the neighborhood. That would be the test that we would have to apply. Um, so that's within our right to grant. Um, for the rear yard setback, um, we've been sort of going back on what the in, of, on how to read the zoning bylaw on this question um, because there's two the the width the minimum width is listed in, in two different places. Um, going strictly by the the table of dimensions, an accessory structure has to be six feet from a side yard and a rear yard, um, <clears throat> and because the existing garage is being removed, um, the existing nonconformity there no longer exists. Um, however, uh, Mr. Hanlon has put forward a different, it reads in the section of the bylaw um, that deals specifically with ADUs, that it allows a reduction in that below six feet with a similar finding from the Board of Appeals that it is not significantly more detrimental. Um, so, Mr. Hanlon, that that's that was the interpretation you had put forward, correct? Yes, that's excuse me, that's right. Um, so, with that, the board could um, address both of those questions um, that you have under Section Four on your slide. Um, we discussed section uh, number three. We just uh, number two is fine. Um, I do have a question about number one, and I'm asking if you could go to the floor plan. There we go. So this is the ground floor, okay. and then this is the second floor. Okay, so on the first floor, the shaded portion is what you are considering the mechanical areas and removing from the gross floor areas. Is that correct? That is correct. So we're accounting 42 square feet uh, so we're using the same interpretation for okay. how we compute floor area. So we're accounting for the walls as part of that space. Mm -hmm. The only concern is th is the that effectively a portion of that is a laundry closet. So the and the, the reason. Or, sorry, sir. Sorry, go ahead. I, no, I was going to say I, I, this is sort of a question for the board. Um, to and we can review the what the what the bylaw says, but the, the question is whether the whether a laundry room should be considered part of the mechanical area of the of the of the structure or not. Uh, if I may add one um, please one reason for why yeah. that was also shaded. So when when our architect Andrew was going through the plan, um, the Water heater we're using is a heat pump water heater that has to be vented. Mm -hmm. And in this view, the vents would actually stick into, would be actually above the washer dryer. So that space is still, in this view, what was primarily serving. The, the reason he put the washer dryer there was because he saw the, the, the ducting for the water heater being above it. And he's found a, a unified washer dryer. Uh, that would actually fit underneath that ducting. Um, so if we had a 3D model that was ready, uh, what we would actually see is this is uh, an HVAC room that's being repurposed as a, a portion of it is being repurposed to have a laundry function just because the, the space below the duct uh, rather than a dedicated laundry room that's being subsumed to become part of uh, an HVAC room. Okay. So the it's a so it's not your typical stacked washer dryer units in their own separate space. It is basically a combined washer dryer standard height unit that fits in underneath the mechanicals for the hot water heater. That's correct. Okay, and this, this is required because this is a heat pump water heater, and we have to duct it um, because of the space constraints we have. Okay, and then the mechanical unit. The, the HVAC unit, that's the other one that's there, that's it, just a, like a ducted split system unit. Is that what that is? Uh, and it's the ERV. Uh, because of uh, this is a oh, passive okay. house, we need to have a, 
a, a ERV system that's split in there and it has all the space for its ducting to, to, to flow around. Oh, okay. Um, and then does the, for the, for the, um, for the heating and cooling, is that, are those wall mount units within the, 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 the rooms or is that a part, connected somehow to the ERV? So it's, uh, I need to reconfigure which system they're finally specking. We had a slightly different version for the previous design uh, that was a little bigger. Um, mm -hmm. But it's still, uh, we will be ducting it from the central unit is my understanding because we couldn't find one that could be ductless. So it'll, it's, not a, it's not a room wall mounted mini split. It's still a central system mm -hmm. where we will have ducts running. So that will be connected to the ERV um, and we'll be sharing some of the uh, the ducting also with the bathroom exhaust fans. So they're all required to be co-located in that area. Great. Okay, thank you. And that um, there's something that, is that there's something indicated under the stairs? Is that, is that a closet? Is that what that is? Yeah. So that's a code closet that we're trying to use on um, the higher end of the risers. Those were the questions that I had. Are there other questions from the board? Mr. Chair. Hearing none. Oh, yes, Mr. Riccardelli. And, um, maybe just two questions. So um, with the uh, new uh, rear yard setback, I know previously, uh, Mr. Ante, you, you guys explained that you were locating a lot of the windows along the back because that was basically preserved land. Uh, were you able to make that work? Uh, now having that five foot setback with the the opening percentage that's required by the code. Yeah. So so we so the reason we're trying to stay over the five foot line because uh, I think that's where the the Massachusetts building called threshold plugins. So with the way the current setback lines up, uh, we're able to. Uh, we comply with building code and have as many openings as we need. So we're we, so, so thank you for flagging that during that's, the previous that's, review. That's great. I'm glad to hear that you were able to make it work. Uh, and uh, the the other question I had, uh, um, maybe for you or maybe for Ms. Geller, um, uh, the, you know, the, there only seems to be one real neighbor um, for this for this location on this property. Um, is there? Um, have you talked with the neighbor? Uh, on the side yard setback side, and uh, is there any any feedback on um, the location of the city? So I um, I know from Erica, and I apologize. I'm sort of stepping in last minute. Um, I believe they've spoken with all the neighbors, and there haven't been any significant comments. And Vikas, if you have any more to add, because I believe you were with Erica. Maybe when you. Uh, I was with Erica when we spoke to the neighbor across the street. Um, I was in Erica when she made contact with the neighbor that's uh, adjacent to this lot. But I do have some pictures on uh, what that because uh, Google Maps is not up to date. Uh, so there's uh, the, the site was updated adjacent to it as they knocked down an existing structure. They redid uh, the existing home. Um, so basically, it's all green space right now. So the picture on the left is what is our pre-existing garage that we are proposing to demolish. Uh, so we'll be obviously coming in a little bit into the setback here. But given that it's all wide open green space here, we don't um, we don't think we'll be intruding on the neighbors too. And... Thank you. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, is there anything further from the board? Hearing none. Um, <clears throat> I will be opening this um, meeting for public comment. So public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the reactions tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone may dial star nine to indicate they would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host asked to give your name and address given time for your questions and comments. 
All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. And anyone wishing to address the board a second time during a particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to speak first for the first time to go first. Um, so with that, if there is any members of the public in attendance who wish to address this application, if they could please um, indicate that they are seeking to do so. So that's the raise hand on the reactions tab, or if you turn on your camera and wave. We have Mr. Moore. Yeah, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, first question, I, I, refresh my memory, was the uh, the roof of this ADU going to be wired for solar panels drawing or something like that, or am I making it up? That, that is correct, uh, Mr. Yeah, Moore. Uh, we will have solar panels. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, what I'm wondering is if the, the modification to the mechanical spaces in the plan, uh, how does that impact the wiring and um, I don't know, the utilization of the solar panels. Is is it all still fitting within the space? Because I know that uh, solar panels often require particular requirements for uh, you know, conduit and spacing and uh, things like that. And I'm wondering if that's impacted at all by the change in the mechanical space. Uh, Mr. Enti? We haven't finished the detailed design for it. My understanding is whatever conduits we need to bring down will be alongside the, the meter bank that we will need to have. Um, and that, I think our expectation at this point is if um, we have availability on setbacks on um, at least in between the two building spacings, if we have to use that space where it doesn't impact um, the, the neighbors. Uh, so that's an option if we have to go down there, but we haven't done the detailed design yet, so I don't know. Right, that does, uh, Mr. Chair, that does make sense to use that space between the buildings. Um, and also, I don't know if there's been any uh, changes regarding the exterior uh, cladding or, or uh, siding that's planned to go on this ADU. Uh, that's a really good question, Mr. Moore. So we've basically gone back to the drawing board on the siding. The reason we don't have elevation profiles to share this time around is we decided to wait till we get the zoning boards okay before we start detailing it up. Um, so at this point, our expectation uh, from also speaking with our client, the Housing Corp of Arlington, is to make it feel, look and comply with what's in the neighborhood. So it'll be clapboard siding, most likely. Uh, we're waiting to get some color specifications from them, uh, but I don't expect it uh, to be significantly different than what you see in the neighborhood. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, that's, uh, that's helpful. I, um... That was one of the concerns I had last time was the siding was so significantly different than the rest of the neighborhood. I'm glad that you're working with um, trying to, to sort of make this fit since uh, the setbacks are minimal here and uh, um, and also, um, you know, make it uh, producible in a, a unitary kind of way, which makes it more affordable for you as uh, the person producing the, the, uh, the housing. But also fitting in with the neighborhood, I think, uh, I think is important. So that's uh, that's good to hear. And I would hope that you would, to whatever extent you can, with prefabricated uh, building materials, follow the um, the design guidelines which which Arlington has. And I'm sure you've been working and uh, looking at already. Thank you, Mr. Chip. Thank you. Sort of following up on Mr. Moore's question, um, I know we had addressed briefly um, the space below the first, between the first floor and the ground. Um, I was curious, Mr. Trenti, if you could just uh, comment a little more on what how that might be infilled. Um, so we're, we're definitely going to have skirting around it. Uh, we haven't specified the material, but it, it, there should be nothing visible. Uh, I think walking into the unit, it should just seem like you have. Uh, there should be full coverage from the siding of the building to the ground, but nothing exposed. So I think we're definitely factoring that in. Uh, okay. It's not going to look any different than, than than units next to it. Okay, I was going to say so. It's going to be. It's not that the siding is going to be brought all the way to the ground, but the the siding will end at the bottom of the the structure, and then like every other house in the neighborhood, you'll have a different surface hitting the ground. Exactly. Okay. Great. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? 
Going once, going twice. I see no one else wishing to address the hearing. So with that, I'll go ahead and close the public comment period for this hearing, um, which returns us back to the board. <clears throat> so what the board has before it, this is a, we have two um, requests in front of us. We have a an application for variance, an application for special permit. Um, as we had discussed at the prior hearing, we had grave concerns that the board could find um, that the criteria required for variance could be met for this property. And we had asked the applicant to go back and to, um, to reconsider what they were proposing so that a variance would not be required. Uh, it definitely appears from um, the information submitted by the applicant that I believe they have addressed all those points and that at this point a variance would no longer be required, uh, which does leave us with the, the question of a special permit. Um, and there are several points that the the applicant um, would need to uh, would need to satisfy um, in order for this. The first is the um, the reduction in the side yard setback, which is is a section six determination. So the board would have to find that the the change in the um, in the side yard setback is not significantly more detrimental uh, to the. Than the than the current condition. Similarly, uh, we would have the same question in regards to the rear yard, where, um, but that is instead of being under section eight, that's actually under sec in section five nine uh, for accessory dwelling units, which allow a, an accessory dwelling unit within six feet of the property line with a determination by the board of appeals that it is not significantly more detrimental to the neighborhood, um, and then. I'm trying to think if there are other, I thought there was one more thing that the board needed to determine. Oh, um, no, I don't think, I don't think there's anything else the board needs to determine because the, the one for the accessory dwelling unit covers two things at once. It's both the accessory dwelling unit being in an accessory building and also being within six feet. That's all included in the same determination. Um, we did have still sort of the open question about the parking. We have discussed an alternative um to the plan and i would i think the board needs to discuss if that's something that we could approve by condition or if that's something that we need um to see in a different fashion before the board can vote um and then the only other question um that i had had initially was the, was the question about the laundry room i think that the applicant has explained that it is rather than being a laundry room um, it is really just sort of a, a portion of a mechanical space that otherwise would be unoccupiable that's being used uh, to house a, a laundry machine, and therefore it's not um, specific as a as a um, as a laundry room. It's more just a, a mechanical space that happens to have a laundry machine in it. And as long as the board is comfortable with that determination, um, then the gross square footage is under 900 square feet. So are there questions and concerns from the board, things that we need to discuss further on this project? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. DuPont. Uh, just very quickly. So, and I just checked with Mr. Cunningham. So I think that it would probably be appropriate to withdraw the application for the variance so that that's clean on the record. And then uh, my two cents on the idea of proceeding with the understanding that the parking is going to be redesigned along the lines that you had suggested um, pursuant to your discussions with inspectional services, I would be fine with that as long as everybody thinks it's clearly understood what it is that needs to be done. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I just wanted to say that I agree with Mr. DuPont on both scores. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, the, the only other question I had too was in regards to, um, so the board does not have revised exterior elevations. And the question is just, is, if there are any members of the board who would want to um, request to see those before voting on approval. Um, the board is allowed to take, to consider the design guidelines as a part of its review. Um, but obviously the, 
we have you know 95% of it. We just don't have final rendered exteriors. Are there any other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman, I think Mr. Cunningham has a comment or a question. Oh, Mr. Cunningham doesn't show up on my screen. Mr. Cunningham, please. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I just wanted to agree with Mr. DuPont, although the withdrawal of the variance would be the prerogative of the applicant um, that would make it cleaner for uh, the Board of Appeals. Uh, however, the, if the applicant wants to withdraw that ap application for the variance, that would make it uh, so that it, the special permit application is the only thing before the board. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. So then that would be a question I believe, for the applicant. Um, so because we have determined that a variance is no longer required, but there's still an open variance application in front of the board, um, <clears throat> it would the board either has to act on it, um, but there's really nothing to act on. So it would be cleaner if it was withdrawn and then the board doesn't have to make a finding. On, uh, on behalf of HCA, uh, as the applicant to file the variance, we would draw the, the request for, for variance 23-1. Right. Thank you. And where it's done before the vote of the board, um, the board can accept the, the withdrawal. Is there any hand to the board need to make a vote to accept the withdrawal or is it just? No, no, Mr. Chair. No. Great, thank you. Okay, with that, then what the board has in front of it is a special permit application. Um, <clears throat> so the board needs to make um, a few different findings. So the first um, is under section 592B, accessory dwelling units. Um, if it's within six feet of a lot line, we need to find that the creation of the accessory dwelling unit is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the use of such accessory building as a private garage or other allowed use. Um, and then under section eight, is it eight one? Which, which section is it? Uh, so under, I think it's eight one. To eight, excuse me, eight one three B non-conforming single-family or two-family dwellings, the increase in the non-conforming nature of a structure will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition. Um, so actually, now that I'm thinking this through, we don't actually need to do that because the accessory dwell with the the finding we make under five nine two B that the accessory dwelling unit within six feet of a lot line, that would cover both the rear and the side lot line. So we do not need to worry about right. section eight at all. Um, so this just boils down to 592B. Um, and then the board would need to typically uses the criteria for a special permit to determine um, whether the this would meet the requirements of a special permit. Um, the first finding is that the requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit in the district. Um, and it is under section 592B, an accessory dwelling unit is allowed um, within six feet of a property line in an, uh, in an accessory structure uh, by a finding of the board. Uh, uh, that the requested use is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare. Uh, the, the board's routinely found that the addition of housing uh, for uh, its residents is a public good and, a, and is, is uh, desirable for public convenience and welfare. The requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. Um, this structure actually has no sidewalk in front of it in the area where this is occurring. And um, there will be no, no addition of uh, parking spaces, so it will not create any additional traffic congestion. Uh, number four, the requested use will not overload any public system. Uh, this will be a minor addition to both the water sewer, or to, excuse me, the water sewer and electrical systems, um, but it will not be a substantial impact. 
It will not impair the character or integrity of the neighborhood. So this is the one where we need to, I think, to, to put the most thought into. Um, so this is something that's new, something that we've not seen before um, in a lot of ways. This is, uh, and the I think the board should, my, my, my sense from the board is that they, they're in agreement that this does not impair the character or integrity of the neighborhood in the way that it has been described by the applicant, that it will be cited uh, similar to other buildings in the neighborhood um, and is you know, is of limited space and is located in a rear yard um, adjacent to a, a wooded area. Um, then the requested use will not be detrimental to the public health or welfare. Um, again, this is just, a, this is a residential use um, in a residential zone. And the requested use will not cause an excess use detrimental to the neighborhood. And that certainly would not apply here. Um, should the board want to vote in favor, um, there are three standard conditions that the board would apply to a case like this. Uh, the first is that the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Number two is the building inspector is hereby notified that they are to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time they determine that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And number three is the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grant. Um, we have also noted that we would want to have a condition in regards to the parking. Um, anybody have some proposed language for what that might look like? Um, All right, the applicant is to provide two parking spaces complying with the size requirement of the zoning bylaw. Be located within the front yard facing which street is that? Parker Street, I think. Thank you. Parker. Street. On a driveway, not to exceed four feet in width, measured parallel to Parker Street. That is, the applicant is to provide two parking spaces complying with the size requirements of the zoning bylaw to be located within the front yard facing Parker Street on a driveway not to exceed 24 feet in width, measured parallel to Parker Street. Does that seem to cover That's what good. we had discussed? Yes. Great. So that will be <laughs> condition number four. Are there any additional conditions that anyone on the board would want to consider. Seeing none. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So I wanted to <clears throat> circle back a little bit to the findings. Please. Uh, <clears throat> on the second finding about the public convenience and necessity, I think there's quite a lot 
more to say here that I'd sort of like to include in the findings. Um, first of all, this is this is con consistent with the town policy of using ADUs in order to provide af affordable housing, which the town des desperately needs. Secondly, it's energy efficient uh, in a way that goes well beyond what is normally done in the town. And it's a good example of the sort of thing that ought to be done. Uh, the third is that it is sort of a variation on that. This is pa passive house net zero, which means it's actually a full net zero proposal. It's not, and and, uh, and, and that is also something that is consistent with the town's uh, 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 energy conservation plan. And I guess that the final thing that at least for me is it's an innovative way uh, using the prefabricated methods and to reduce the costs of providing the ADUs in this kind of housing and at the same time uh, greatly improving sustainability. So when you get down to thinking about why this is in the public interest, there's there's quite a bit, both in terms of reducing costs and in terms of increasing sustainability, both of which are matters of great concern to the town. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hanley. Are there further comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, the chair would entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. Uh, <clears throat> I move that the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals uh, approve the special permit application uh, subject to the three standard conditions and the fourth condition that the chair read into the record. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin and Mr. DuPont. So this will be a roll call vote of the board on docket uh, 3770-4042 Dorothy Road. It's a motion to approve a special permit with four conditions. Uh, so vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Oops, sorry, Mr. Riccardelli, I didn't hear you. Aye. Thank you. And the chair votes aye, so that the special permit for Dorothy Road is approved. Well, thank you all very much. Appreciate the the extra effort um, that you put in between the two hearings. Uh, I think it really created a quite a nice proposal. So thank you very much for that. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We would love to invite you all to the open house when it's uh, <laughs> most likely happening in March. So thank you again. Thank you. It would be great. Bye. Okay, with that, we return uh, <laughs> back to the initial business on our agenda. So the first item is the motion to approve the written decision for 28 Buena Vista Road. This was a case that we heard at our October 24th hearing. Um, decision was written by Mr. Hanlon, distributed to the board for questions and comments, and the final version uh, was released uh, this evening before the hearing. Um, are there any further questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 28 Buena Vista Road? Seeing none, um, I'll accept a motion to approve the written decision for 28 Buena Vista Road. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board in favor of the written decision. Uh, voting members who voted at the hearing, uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. That written decision is approved. Um, so <laughs> this brings us up to um, sort of discuss, discussion of uh, procedural business and rules and regulations. So there is a there is a new procedure for applying for uh, special permits and variances. Um, 
which is it's a new online system. Uh, I don't know if any of you have played around with it. Um, but I had played with it a little bit. It um, Currently, there's not a lot of guidance as to how to proceed on it. And um, there may be something the board wants to, to take on to uh, put together some things. Uh, I would ask um, Colleen if she could, she has anything she's noticed in particular about applications, changes in the applications coming through the new system. Hi. For the most part, um, the people are having trouble a little bit with the calculations. It's not as clear, I guess, on this one. Um, I've tried to find something that we could put up that would define each um, calculation for them, but it's, there's nothing clear on that one either. There's a lot of things in the bylaws that say like how to calculate and lots of descriptions, but no clear how to calculate. Um, and I think that's where most people are running into questions. They call me a lot and ask. Um, I send them to Dave. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we could find a better way where they could just do it, it would be much easier for them. Do you think it would be helpful if they sort of did it on paper first and then transferred it into the system as they went? I do. I think that the paper system that we had um, had a little bit more guidance on it. Um, but I think, Christian, you and I talked yeah. about a lot of people are homeowners trying to do it themselves. And they're not right. architects and they're not building inspectors or contractors. And some of them just don't know what they're calculating. Okay. So I think this is something that the, the board should probably take on to some extent. Um, drafting some kind of a guidance guidance document and whether you know in the past all we had given them was the the application and they sort of fuddled through it but they would come in with it and talk to the inspector as they filled it out and um it's unclear how much that is still happening um yeah so most I, most of the new program is um because it's all online, even payment online. Um, mm -hmm. There's not a lot of people coming in to ask the questions. They're calling, and it's hard to walk them through some of the calculations when you don't have a plot plan or a drawing in front of you. Sure. Yeah. And a caveat to that is they can't submit the application until everything's finished, so they can't unless they email you pictures that you're trying to print to scale, it doesn't always work. So could they, they can partly fill it out and save it, but they can't submit it to you until everything is complete. Yes. Saves as a draft in their account until it's complete. Okay. But you can't go and see it when it's in that state. No, we can't see it until they actually submit it. sort of ask Dan and, and Venkat and Elaine and Adam if they've run into online application systems and have any advice. I haven't, oh, I haven't really run into one before. Yeah, I haven't come across it yet. Um, the BPDA, the Boston mm -hmm. one is online. Um, I, but I wouldn't say that there is um, good guidance that uh, accompanies it. <laughs> so uh, I don't know that we should use that as an example. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, so I, th this is not from the voice of experience, the way you did the people who are actually dealing with other, but it seems to me that that at least a logical way of thinking about it is for us to have a series of instructions, I think maybe separate instructions put into and put on our website so that they mm -hmm. have, uh, <clears throat> so that it it has it, it addresses the things that we think of as the as the key questions. 
uh, to some extent, I think we can start with what we already have. And then instead of sort of having a sheet that they have to submit and so forth, we can just include something at the end as a worksheet. I, mm -hmm. I do know that that to some extent, we all we were, we're we we do ordinarily get where we're in the where it just says look look to the way of calculating gross floor area in the you know in the bylaw we may need to take that out and provide more specific mm -hmm. instructions i think that whenever you tell even professionals but certainly ordinary people and give them a cross reference that that doesn't usually prove to be very effective uh, but I think if we did that, then we could at least create something where they thought it through in the right way. Um, and I think it might be helpful just to, from my point of view is to say, I mean, I don't know how to, to deal with this. Very often there are people who say N.A. and that's never the that's almost never the right answer, or at least not without a lot of consultation <laughs> with ISD. Right. And so just because it's too much of a pain in the neck to figure it out doesn't mean that you don't have to figure it out. And people ought to be encouraged to be careful. But we can put some much true words in it. I mean, frequently you see that when people in the very first thing on special permits, we say, um, where does it say in the bylaw that you can have a special permit? And typically many people answer that by by just saying what the provision is of the special of the bylaw that they want relief from and not what they're supposed to be saying which is what is it that gives them the right to is to relief by special permit and if we're doing a little bit more detailed than we do in the application form you can at least take commonly made errors and either and you stick them in as a new, new sentence to make sure that they get it or or maybe do things in the form of a frequently asked questions to make it more pointed but in doing that we might be able to make this a little, make it work a little better and when they finally get down to put the application the things in they may have already done the worksheet and it may facilitate the conversation later on when uh, inevitably there will be some cases where it isn't right and where you, uh, a new discussion has to take place. Yeah, very good. Uh, so if the board was to draft a set of uh, a guidance doc, uh, is there anyone who would like to take a first stab at that? Well, I'd be willing to try. Okay. Patrick, do you have a copy of the um, previous application that I can send, or do you need me to send you one? Oh, you should probably send it. I I think I have a copy of it. I think we've got, we get copies of it regularly, but I'd like to see what they see, which I don't know that for sure that I'm doing. Okay. Um, I was also told that you know you guys can go in and create yourself an account and do everything and leave it in draft and never submit it. But that would give you an idea of what it's like to just go through the process. Yeah. Okay. The link is on the front page of the zoning website and um, the inspectional services. Okay. So in some ways, there's a parallel thing that goes along with the uh, variance application. I don't know what people are currently getting, but, you know, maybe with a little elaboration, since people seem to get the topography a little odd, uh, mm -hmm. we could, we could again, use what we already have and <clears throat> emphasize the ways in which this is different. I mean, look at how many, look at how many cases we get where people make a variance application and they don't really understand what the difference is between a variance application and a special permit. Right. No, absolutely. While I'm on a roll, we have a draft, I think a draft, I'm not sure that we've ever done it, on the residential design guidelines. Mm -hmm. And I would like us to take a look at that draft. And as long as we're going to have a website with helpful guidance in it, I think it would be useful to put that on, which actually forces people to focus on what the actual language of, of the guidelines are and not just sort of say, well, in general, it's all good and consistent with the neighborhood. And 
and I, I, so I, I I'd encourage us to do that. We it's it, it and I I'd encourage us also. We also say, well, it is they're voluntary, so obviously we can't just. But I do think that it's important to say that. It, it may very well be that we can say whether you comply with the guidelines is perfectly is voluntary. Mm -hmm. And we the, the standard we apply is the standards in Section 3.3.3. .3 but we don't think an explanation of what you've done is voluntary. In right. other words, what we, we want to see that you've gone through this analysis. You could the, what your analysis could say is we think the zoning bylaw should pound sand because we've got other reasons why we think we're entitled to this. And maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. But showing that they've gone through the analysis and uh would would make them actually go through the analysis, which is would be a would be a plus. It's it's been particularly difficult since we don't get planning department memos anymore, which routinely right. go into this. So you know, and I've I've noticed that since we stopped getting that, the we've talked a lot less about the the residential design guidelines than we did before, um, and it it would be helpful to try to tee that up procedurally so people feel it's necessary at least to explain their position on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what I have up on the screen, so this is something we had pulled together, I'm guessing a while ago now. Did I put a date on it? Nope. Um, but there was some confusion, there was some concern at the time because it is voluntary that by making a form, you're sort of forcing, are we forcing people to abide by the design guidelines? Um, and this does include the, you know, although strict adherence to the design guidelines is voluntary, they express the design principles that the board will use in evaluating residential projects requiring special permit or variance. For each principle listed below, please describe how your project responds to the design guidelines. Um, So this is certainly something we could include as a part of the the uh, the application guide. Um, I don't know if this is something that we would want to have them submit electronically necessarily, or if it's just something ancillary that they would either bring to the hearing or just or submit independently, depending on how we want to do it. Mr. Chair. If it's voluntary, then we, yes, sir. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to offer some uh, perspective. Sure. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Mr. Moore. Uh, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. We had uh, an issue like this on the tree committee where we've got what's called construction guidelines for the protections of the critical root zones of trees either on the property or on the neighboring property and such. And we refined it over time they are guidelines. They're not requirements because we can't require that it happen. But what it what it works for us is it offers a point of leverage. Um, and you, if you don't have them fill out a form like this, you could have a checkbox somewhere that says you've read them. And that allows you as a board to leverage points in it that you want them to pay attention to. Not necessarily, I know again, you can't make it happen, but it's a point of leverage for uh, you to bounce their per their perceptions off of, and it, it's been useful to us. Um, it, it even though, uh, for instance, in critical root zones, if they're not using the correct method for whatever work they're doing, we can say, "Well, it's right here, and we show you how. Why did you not do that?" or that sort of thing. So, so I would suggest you do this. I mean, I think Mr. Hanlon's comments are 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 well taken. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. No, appreciate the experience. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. I, I, just in terms of, of language, I think it would be helpful actually to say strict, when, when it, to eliminate the word strict in the lead in, because even general oh. compliance with these is not really actually required. They're just, they're guidelines. Um, right. And so I, it, but 
But secondly, I think that we ought to say that uh, we, I mean, this is not going to be exact language necessarily, but I think we ought to say that the that the guidelines uh, often prove relevant to the board in considering such issues as neighborhood compatib compatibility, because that puts people on notice that sure they don't have to do with the guidelines. They can say, you know, I want to make it look like crazy Ludwig's capital castle, <laughs> but but the, we're going to be looking at the guidelines and assessing neighborhood compat compatibility, which we do have the authority mm -hmm. to require. And uh, and so a sensible person might want to speak to our condition here and uh, help show why it is that uh, mm -hmm. that you and use this as a way of making their point on the on the requirements of Section three point three point three. Um, so anyway, it, it 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 focuses more on just what we mean by you know what it what's voluntary mm -hmm. and what isn't right. This is this is a help for the applicant really to understand yeah. where we're coming from when we do something when we apply this. And there's a specific provision. This could come up in other provisions too, but there's a specific provision about uh, neighborhood compatibility that this that this is almost always relevant to. And somebody who wants some help in thinking about about how to persuade us should understand that that showing what they've done in terms of the guidelines is is helpful to them. This so anyway, you can sort of figure that around and, and what you've just done is is right. But I think it is it it helps it helps to sort of make to position this as not just another bunch of requirements, but mm -hmm a way of showing that you meet a requirement that already exists. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So I'm just looking at the language, you know, sort of trying to split the difference between a requirement and a strong suggestion. And I'm not sure what the answer is, but in the third paragraph where it says the design guideline guidelines is is voluntary or are voluntary, but um, adherence to the design guidelines is voluntary. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, they express the design principles that the board will use. Um, is used to soft a word d d upon which the board w relies, or is that too strong a word? I'm just wondering because you really do want to get them to focus on these, even if they're not mandatory, because it's for their you know, it's for their benefit, obviously, if they do. And I, I didn't know. So use is fine, but I just didn't know whether rely upon is a little bit more, you know, a little bit more pointed and tells them you should pay stronger attention. Just a thought. Yeah, no, it's, So one of the other things we had sort of thought about earlier on and I really looked at in a while um, was putting together a checklist so that people who are applying know what they need to have. Um, and this could be something that we could adopt into a lead in into a guide document. Um, originally this was when you were submitting everything paper so you would have to do it all but like information needs to be filed electronically um, applicants are advised to gather all the requested information before initiating the online permitting process oh. and that was probably going to be bold um so the completed requests so th this is sort of these were the documents we had before um so I think, sir, as we were discussing, what we might do is rather than handle things in this fashion, we would do it um, a little more sort of line by line going through the information that needs to be provided. Um, one of the things that often happens to us is that there is information that occurs on both the dimensional and parking information sheet and on the open space gross floor area sheet. And the same figure will be entered differently on the two sheets. So one of the things we can, and the 
the way that it appears on the website right now, we we ask the same question twice. So we could either have it be that we only ask the question once, like what the gross floor square area of the building is. We just ask it one time and we don't ask again. Or we have it autofill the second time it appears so that we don't. But it, it seems if they're entering information, maybe we just need to only ask them once for some of this information. Um, then before we were asking people to submit stuff electronically separately, but now obviously everything has to be submitted electronically. Um, so a lot of this now is just sort of general guidance in terms of what they're gonna be asked to provide. Um, so we can sort of clean this up. Where's some of the other? So we have a similar thing for uh, variances. Um, we've looked at the design review, special permit checklist. Uh, let's, um, let's see. Not regular. Oh, that's the regulations, variance checklist. Um, yeah, so I think if we go through and sort of we can combine a bunch of these things into into something and I can Pat I, you and I can work on that I'm coming up with a, a plan for that um there are a couple other ones I just want to bring our attention to uh one which I've already started doing uh the special permit conditions uh standard condition number two it, it had gendered language so I've been as I've been reading it I've been editing it um and changing the he is to they are and the he determines to they determine um, that's the only bit of gendered language that we have in here. So I just wanted to pull that out. Um, I'm just going to sort of do that, uh, going forward. Um, and I had started pulling together an application for an appeal, but I'm not sure we necessarily need to have. Pat, you and I had talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, typically when people are, are appealing, they're filing a lawsuit more. And so we, we don't really need an application. And I, I had put together sort of the appeal procedure, but the more I put, the more I wrote into this, the more I got concerned that if something changes in state law or something changes that the town and we don't catch it here, like where, you know, is that going to be a problem? Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, sir. I sort of think, I don't, I don't think, I mean, I don't think that is in itself a problem because I, the the state does not change the zoning rate the the forty a very often, and if there's an amendment to section fifteen, mm -hmm. we'll know about it. Right. I don't. Mr. Cunningham will probably bang us over the head about it. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I don't think that this isn't the sort of thing where little regulations happen from time to time and, and you have to be constantly watching the watching to make sure you catch them. We'll 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 sort of get that. I, I think that there is another problem, though, and that it's it's that kind of means that I, th I think that we need to do some more thinking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, the in the in the draft that we have here, we have a partial um statement of section eight which is where the appeal authority to comes from um but and the actual language is more is murkier than the part that we quote here and um it involves other kinds of it potentially involves other kinds of uh actions by the uh, zoning administrator or, or not the zoning administrator by by ISD than just the ones that are indicated here. I mean, just recently, for example, we have had uh, occasions where someone is attempting to 
uh, appeal the uh, grant of a of a uh, building permit to somebody else, uh, and that doesn't really that certainly doesn't fit from the language that you can appeal failure to obtain the building permit, and none of the people who do that actually go through the procedure that that you'd expect. Uh, when it comes to requesting an enforcement action. Um, and that puts us in a situation where we're kind of improvising the procedures uh, as as we go along. So some of this is very, very specific about what has to be where and so on, because Section 15 is very specific. And some of it is, is a little bit nonspecific. And I think we need to figure out as I think we're going to be seeing more of this. And I think that we need to kind of work on figuring out what what we think the actual procedure is. The, the the board may remember in some earlier cases, we've had appeals where the timeliness is a question, as it often is. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty is, is that we don't have a formal procedure that necessarily produces a paper that says, this is a final decision. You have 30 days to appeal. So you get a stream of, of uh, a stream of, of correspondence and ISD some often way after the opportunity to appeal is over saying, well, the letter on, on August 8th, 2022 should have told them that they were barking up the wrong tree and they, and that's where it starts. And the other people say, no, this is just, this was just, back and forth as we were trying to work our way through this. And that's not a denial at all. So you need to know, it, it, just in fairness, we need to have some way of being sure what the starting gun uh, mm -hmm. is for any of these things. And th there are procedures in state law that, that we haven't really focused in on a lot. But I think that this is one of those things where it's not a matter where we know exactly what we're supposed to do, and it's a matter of explaining it clearly. This is a matter where we need to have some 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 help, probably from Mr. Cunningham, and and spend mm -hmm. some time thinking about what the various possibilities are and how um, and how we can sort of guide people into into doing it because. Uh, so I'll, I'll just stop there, because I, I don't know the answer to all these questions. Okay. Mr. Cunningham has his hand up. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I would. I agree with Mr. Hanlon. I would like to be involved, especially in this portion of the these these public materials. I think mm -hmm. it's good. I think it's good that the board wants to provide some guidance to the public and be helpful in terms of uh, all all processes, including the appeal procedure. However, to the extent that there are some items that might be a bit ambiguous or gray, you know, issues like timing, which can vary um, based on the factual circumstances of cases. Uh, we want to be, the board wants to be careful not to drift into areas of um, legal guidance um, rather than just strict, um, you know, timing mechanisms or just general guidelines. I think that the, we want to make sure that the, the board would want to make sure that those guys, that whatever is out there for especially the appeal procedure does not drift too far into uh, or anywhere near um, legal guidance for a public person. Yeah. Point well taken. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. DuPont. So at the risk of sounding uh, like I'm making a joke, I mean, you can always put language in the saying, you know, any questions that you have about your legal rights in this regard, you know, should be, uh, you can refer to an attorney or something along those lines. I think that that's sort of standard contractual language, which might also fit in here somewhere, you know, just telling them that if they do and then that may even underscore Mr. Cunningham's point that we're not giving them legal advice. That should they want legal advice, they've got to go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to point out, and this may be a bit nitpicky, but it also refers to this application, the appeal, as well as the the requests for variance and um, for special permit. Um, for clarity's sake, I I think what these are is. You know, this is entitled an appeal to the permit granting authority. I don't think that's what it is. I think it's an application for an appeal. 
And I think that one way or the other, this needs to be consistent and clear because when you go down to the third paragraph, it says this application for appeal, number one. So you're referring to it as an application as opposed to an appeal. And then when you get on to the second page, um, in number two, it says this the application and copy of the order or decision. And then three says a copy of the certified application. And if I'm in four, actually also refers to application as does five. And I, I think it's important for people to be able to look at it and say, well, what's the application? Oh, it, this is what it is. So I don't know if you'd call it an application for an appeal or appeal to the permit granting authority application. Um, but I think it's it would help, at least from my point of view, for consistency to understand what we're referring to when we call later on in the body of this, you know, when we refer mm -hmm. to the application. And and I also think that that's true for the zoning, for the uh, variance and the special permit, which are entitled requests, which seems a bit vague to me because it's not really a request either. It's really yeah. an application for and, you know, again, maybe I'm being a bit nitpicky and everybody knows what they are and what they mean, but I, I'd, it, I'd like it to be consistent. And I would also note that the attachments that you included, the file names are application for a special permit, application for appeal and application for variance. So, mm -hmm. you know, just, just a matter of uh, clarity from where I'm sitting. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. So I think that Mr. That was certainly with respect to the applications for for uh, variants or so on that we should we should be using application um, because I think that's what's that's what the zoning bylaw itself uses. Um, with respect to appeals, I think it's different. the The appeal actually is the application here. If you the the ultimately the provision that allows for these appeals is section eight of chapter forty a, and the chat the heading of that is appeals to permit granting authority, uh, and the 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 uh, the the text of the section uh, is is also uh, speaks in in that language. So by by the same token that 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 Mr. DuPont's argument is, I think we should be sticking with the uh, language that's used in Section 8, which is basically the same as the language that is being used uh, in 3.1.3, .3, which says an appeal to the Board of Appeals may be taken by any person aggrieved due to inability to obtain a permit or enforcement action from the building inspector as provided in section eight. So uh, we got to be, I think, sticking with with that language. Um, I don't know, well, we got, as, as anybody looking at this would immediately know, the question of who a person aggrieved is, is not necessarily a trivial question either, but that's getting more into understanding how far one go goes. I, I do think that, that it would be it might be helpful if we are doing something along these lines to what is to make it clear that that uh, uh, the ultimate authority here is is uh, section section eight for, for for part of it, but section fifteen, which sets forth the precise procedures and uh, if there's any difference between what we happen to have and what and what section 15 is requires, uh, then section 15 state law obviously prevails. So that that point is taken, if I may respond, but I just think that Please. in the third third paragraph where it says sure. this application for appeal, I I just you know I'm not clear that a lay person necessarily reading this knows. You know that this document is the appeal. I mean, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but it's clearly an application for an appeal. And and I'm willing to leave it alone. I'm just saying that it seems a bit inconsistent to me yeah. when you read the document. I don't think it's necessarily um, internally coherent unless you say very clearly that this 
is an application for the appeal. And I suppose it does that in this application for appeal. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I, I'm fine with what Mr. Hanlon just said. Yeah, I, I would just I I would I agree with the idea of consistency. I just think that this is and this is not an application for an appeal. It's an appeal. OK. Just in the background here, going to the zoning board website and clicking on the online portal because I couldn't recall. Um, uh, click on special services. You can apply for a variance. You can apply for a special permit. You cannot apply online and appeal. Similarly, you cannot apply for a comprehensive permit online either. Okay. Well, we can look more into the into this question, but certainly the other two applications, one for special permit and the one for variance, have basically been superseded by the online procedure, except that we can cannibalize the language for guidelines. Um, the other thing I did want to look at was our regulations. Um, I'm sure now if you've been around for a few years, I don't know if anybody's had a real opportunity to look at it. There are a few places I had wanted to address some things. Um, basic stuff at the front hasn't changed at all. Application procedures. Um, this application process section um, I think it's something that we would, once we have a doc, a guide document in place, we can either address it all in that document or we need to address in our rules and regulations exactly what the application process is because uh, what we have now is no longer correct. Um, but I can review this a little more with, uh, with Colleen offline and then we can come back to it. Um, the coordination with other boards, uh, the pre-hearing process. Um, a lot of this is just capitalization things. Um, so submission of applicable fees. So Colleen, does everyone now submit their fees online or do some people still come in and bring a check? There is an option to bring it in, but most of the time okay. people are using their credit cards or um, e-checks. Okay. Um, because one thing that has happened before is that people, um, they write a check and it's included in the pack. The photocopy is made and included in the package as a proof of having paid and the routing number and check number are, and the, uh, account number are not redacted. And then it is just all to that number is then posted online. So I want to make sure that we're not doing that. No, uh, all that information is captured in the application. Mm -hmm. So you can find it, see what check number and what date they paid, but yeah. um, it, it won't be public. Yeah. No, it, it it usually happens in comprehensive permit application packages. That's where it, I've seen it. So it's more the applicant doing it to themselves. But um, And then we did have a section here on the preparation of the planning mem memorandum, which is no longer happening. Um, so I was proposing to call it a preparation zoning guidance letter. The building inspector or designate shall provide a letter to the board outlining the request or requests and indicating the sections of the zoning bylaw requiring action by the board. Um, and that's something that, um, that Mike has been do Mike and Colleen have been putting together on some of our recent hearings. Um, so I just want to make that change because we're no longer getting a memorandum from the planning department and as best as I could tell, this was the only place that I it was required. Um, and, uh, under adherence to the decorum, um, according to state law, we are not allowed to tell people they have to be the polite. Um, so just pulling that, anything else I assume is fine. And once I've gone, once 
we've gone through this. Um, obviously, Mike will send a, a copy to the legal department for review. Um, a couple more capitalizations. Um, so one thing on withdrawal that this came up tonight, uh, according to our rules, um, an applicant withdrawing more than 48 hours before uh, it's withdrawn without prejudice, but the applicant may further withdraw the application that is before the board up until the time they vote. But this shall, and it, it says in our stuff, shall result in the forfeiture of all fees, um, which would be a with prejudice. Um, does anybody have any care one way or another if we leave the word shall or should we change it to may? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, I th I think that we probably should say may, and my reason for it is that frequently the withdrawal of the application is something that is, I mean, like tonight, for example, a major thing was that they were getting the relief that they needed, and they didn't need to leave something in there for us to deny and then to be dealing later on with the notion that the board has taken an adverse action. Um, and, but, you know, occasionally we do, uh, when people withdraw an application, uh, 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 do something with respect to fees. Sometimes, sometimes it's preserving rights to come back to us, uh, <laughs> when something is not very ripe. And, uh, I know this happens with some of Mr. Nessie's cases in particular and where, it's in our interest for that they do that as well as their own interests. And we, you know, in order to make it all work better, we, we do sometimes waive fees. So I, 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 I think that shall is more than actually is accurate mm -hmm. and, uh, but nobody should count on the fee being waived. Right. And are we the arbiters of, waiving or not i don't remember ever having a discussion where that came up where somebody withdrew I mean, we've we sometimes had the question about the, the question of prejudice and what exactly it means yeah um and i think we've sort of decided in the past that if we if we say it's with prejudice then we're not returning their money Mr. Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in response to Mr. DuPont's question, I would interpret this as yes, the board is the arbiter. And I agree with Mr. Hanlon. I think that the use of the permissive language may uh, protects the board's discretion in instances, in instances where it wants to uh, require that the fees be forfeited, but not require it to. Mr. Chairman, yeah, if I may, just to emphasize is that I don't remember an occasion where we said you can withdraw it and we'll and we'll give you back the money you already paid. Yeah. Usually, this comes up in the future that you can withdraw it and and you can file it without without putting you can refile it later on mm -hmm. without paying the fees again. Uh, and and that has come up. I can recall several yeah. cases where we've done that. Yeah, I think I think that's more correct. Regarding reconsideration, that option. So, um, Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, Colleen. I didn't see. Um, so, like in the case of um, the one we saw her tonight, Dorothy Road, they did a variance and a special permit, and in the new system, that would charge them four hundred dollars each. Um, and they just thought it was one application for a hearing. So was there any place in there that says if you need more than one application, you will be paying for both? Mm. Or is that not a rule? <laughs> I hope it's not a rule. Because the new system will charge them for each application. Um, in the past, there have been a lot of people who ask why they have to pay twice for one hearing. I 
that's a good question. So So is that something, is there a way in the system for the town to, I guess the town would have to reimburse on that $400 if that was the case, right? right. There's not a way, there's not a way to just waive it. There is in the system. I don't have the authority, but um, Mike does. He could waive one of them if he wanted to. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I just, I don't know if that's something that, is there a reason why we would do that? Um, or is that standard practice they pay for each application and then that's just how they pay? I'll be honest, I have no idea. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. I'll be honest, I've been charging them for both. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. What, what bothers me a little bit about this is that, you know, the... the Somebody who applies for a permanent variance, both, is not necessarily asking us to do any more uh, than, or ISD actually, to do any more. It, it's a, strictly the legal accident as to whether or not they need a variance or a, a special permit. We have many special permit issue cases which have substantial issues, including some where they get to us and we especially find a non-conforming uh, structure issue that nobody has raised before. And they can be easily as expensive. The notion the notion that that because they're two separate legal two separate legal authorities, that that should very, that should necessarily correlate with how much work is done with or the the town's actual cost of of processing the application doesn't seem right to me uh and you know to the point where i can think of some constitutional cases that raise a question as to whether or not something like that is a proper fee if if it's not reasonably uh, related to the town's cost of processing the application so I would think that the normal rule is that if they're applying for relief, the fact that they include that some of the relief may be for a, a permit and, and, or a variance should should not affect the amount that's charged. That said, I'm not sure that that's within our wheelhouse anyway, but it, it does seem unfair to me uh, to do that. Yeah, I guess we should find out what the standard practice. So I know what the Colleen, you said sir, what the standard practice is now that we're online. I'm curious what the practice was before. For the most part, um, it kind of depended on who took the application in. Some people at the front desk would take a check for each, and others would take one check. And um, I didn't always go back for the second check on people when they did one, because most times when I said it. They were like, no, I, it's one hearing. Why should I pay for two? Right. Is the, so for the, for you, when you are like doing the advertising, do you have to advertise the special permit and the variance separately or are they advertised together? They do get advertised together and it's a little bit more. It's like 280 to three something to do a regular one. You add the variance, the extra words or letters um, make it more like 340 to advertise. Okay. You almost want them to pay like one and a half. Um. All right, we can discuss what that should be. Once we begin doing this, we could, if we were really going after money, say that if you if you uh, apply for a special permit based on two provisions of the zoning bylaw, that you have to pay separately for each provision. Absolutely. 
that that also would increase the length of the notice and would therefore increase the cost. Right. Yeah, as long as we're doing it all on one legal notice with two a special permit and a variance listed, then it it does it's much cheaper than doing two separate. Right. So I guess it's more that if if the application for the special permit and the variance happens at the same time, it's one thing. But if they happen at separate times, then it needs to be something different. Right. I'll have to figure out how to try to make that work. Um, the chair will no oh, doubt remember one really case in which here. Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. I remember one case up on Highland Street, which had a special permit and a variance that actually were instead of being all consolidated into one thing, were actually processed as if they were two entirely separate applications and we ended up granting one and and not the other. And we never heard them both on the same night, as I can recall. We one night was the special permit one, the another night was yeah. the was the variance one. There it does seem to me appropriate. I mean, you know, in some ways, the applicants who say, wait a minute, there's one hearing, as long as it's only one hearing, why am I paying two fees, is yeah. is sort of showing that sometimes it's mostly it's all one hearing, but occasionally it's not. Right. And in, in that case, specifically, the variance had absolutely nothing to do with the special permit. Like right. They were completely separate. Right. So. have to. I'll. I'll I'll talk to to um, Mike Champo about that. See what he want, what he thinks. Um, and the, so the rest of this, I can um, I can revise and get back out to the to the board if there's any more questions, and then run it by uh, Mr. Cunningham as well. Um, yeah, because I walked through all those. Okay. Now, are there any other? Um, oh, so the only other, so that was it, I think, for our documents. Um, are there any other questions about sort of the documentation we have or things that we need? Mr. Chairman, this is really this is really more meta than that. But I would I would very much like, uh, after a certain decent interval, say nine months after we do this, mm -hmm. to try to figure out some way, like all of the businesses that we relate to, of getting surveys back and you know getting a sense of what it looks like from the people who are from the point of view of the people who are doing applications. Mm -hmm. how how easy this is to work with where people have problems if they do have problems and so forth to get to get some feedback basically from the customers so to speak uh to see whether or not this is working in in the way in which we intend to facilitate the applications and make everything work more smoothly both from our point of view and from that of the public I'll certainly try to figure out how to do that i know we've Brought that up in the past. We haven't done much on it, but um, yeah, no. Especially now that we've got a whole new system, that might be helpful. Mr. Moore, did you have a question? Um, I was just thinking that you could, upon granting of a permit or a very, I'm sorry, an appeal of a permit or a variance or whatever, um, you could either make that request or make that a requirement. There's no reason you can't add that as a condition, uh, return of a survey uh, on, on process, and it would have to be kind of a standardized thing that everyone had to do. 
but you might want to, I know force is the wrong word, but you might want to make sure that happens uh, <laughs> because, you know, a bunch of months later, their memories are not going to be particularly clear. You want to get them having just gone through the process, what their views are on the process. So that might be helpful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Mr. Chair. Yeah. A lot, a lot of the people that we have done stuff with this past year send emails and I could forward them. Most of them thank the board, thank, you know, thank the process, you know, glad that everything's happened so well. Um, and so, you know, I wasn't, I haven't been forwarding them one at a time to everybody, but I'm more than happy to if they want to see them. I can probably go back and find quite a few of them from this year. Yeah, yeah that, would, that would certainly be helpful, especially if they have any pointers on anything. Okay. And then the last thing I wanted to, to talk briefly about tonight. Um, so the, the, the town town meeting warrant is going to open in hmm. January. And the process for that starts now in terms of the board starting to talk about what they want to, what they might want to include, um, if there are any changes to the bylaws. And so, Mr. Cunningham, hand up fast. Sorry, Mr. Chair. <laughs> The uh, warrant actually opens in December. I believe it's December 8th. Oh, it does. It closes in ah, December 8th. Ah, okay. All right. So um, the, we, at the time that we were doing the Mount Vernon Street case, there was the whole question about whether the, the difference between a building being attached and detached and that sort of there being a gap quite literally in the bylaw between the two. Um, and we had flagged that as something we thought that the ARB should look at. Um, the ARB deferred uh, past the fall because of the fall was already pretty busy. Um, but I've asked I've asked them to reconsider this um, and possibly some other things. So the, the chair of the ARB asked if I could put together a list and come and talk to the ARB about it. So. Um, I had a few different items that I wanted to sort of put out there and see if there were other ones the board thought might be helpful. Um, so the first one was that question of attached versus detached um, and trying to make a little more consistency in that. Uh, the second one I had flagged is in the, the section of the bylaw on um, accessory dwelling units. It's the only place in the bylaw where there are bullets and things are not lettered. And it gets difficult to refer to, oh, it's in 592B1 bullet three sub A or something. So asking them to possibly uh, re-letter that section so that it makes more sense. Um, and then subsequent to that, um, we had come, I had asked them to take a, it had come up the average Average setback exception to the minimum front yards. Um, so that section is written that it includes the word vacant lots. So it sort of implies that if you have a, a lot that's already developed, that it wouldn't apply. So I just want to clarify from the ARB whether that's the intent or whether it's supposed to apply to all cases. So that's something that I wanted them to look at as well. Um, and then I wanted to the, the, she had written back and said that they're take they're going to be looking at the Arlington Heights business overlay district is something they're looking at for the spring. Um, but I wanted to see if there were any other things that uh, the board, the members of the board have sort of come across in, in their research on the zoning bylaws or in our work here on the board. If there's anything else they think that deserve the ARB's attention in terms of um reconsidering in the zoning bylaw um the other one that i'd mentioned to them is the the residential parking guideline uh, residential parking section is a horror show um i'm not entirely sure if we're going to get to that this cycle but it's just definitely something that needs 
some serious consideration. If there's any other sections of the zoning bylaw that people think are in need of assistance. Um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I, I don't think this is quite ready yet, um, but in recent cases on a couple of occasions, we've been we've had our attention uh, directed to the flood uh, the flooding provision of the bylaw and which seems to me to have been drafted at a point where there where there was we, we may not have had a sufficiently robust, uh, wetlands bylaw and the conservation commission may not have had the capabilities that it has today um and but the being in, after after an issue has been decided as 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 it was recently by the conservation commission to be sort of saying well that's okay for them but for but the board the zoning by, bylaw is quite different and and you have to do something else eventually those things all have to come together to support a single policy towards flooding and wetlands. And, uh, and actually, I think in most respects, the Conservation Commission is a more capable body to do that than we are. Uh, and I would like to see some thought maybe given through a joint work between the two commissions to come up with something that, that more clearly delineates whose responsibility is which and avoids mm -hmm. the possibility of applicants or others attempting to turn one body against against the other by uh, by interpreting them without reference to one another i don't know i have no idea what the answer to that is but it just doesn't seem like it's a structure that is is up to date or that is conducive to uh, yeah. an effective program yeah and so that would be five seven which is the floodplain district and five eight, which is the inland wetland district. Right. Are both sort of in that same category. Right. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So very briefly, and again, not to be too nitpicky, and I think Mr. Hanlon has addressed this correctly before when we talk about the accessory dwelling units and the reference to um you can have an accessory dwelling unit, and if it's within six feet of the lot line, then you can uh, have it allowed by a special permit. However, the way it's worded seems to me to be um, if the building is located, it almost suggests that it already exists. And I know we did have this conversation a little bit, and I don't think that it makes sense to deny something because you want to build a new accessory building. But I would just point out that if you go into the zoning bylaw and you look at the um, district yard and open space requirements, you see accessory buildings and it clearly says, you know, that there are side yard and rear yard setback requirements of six feet. Yeah. Now, if you then go to um, uh, 5.4.2B7, where it's the garages and it says they don't, they don't. Uh, private detached garages need not conform to a side yard uh, and or rear yard setback. So we know that despite what it says in those open space yard and open space requirements, that there is the exception to build a garage, right? So we have that, uh, that's there. So you could go build a garage. And I, I think we talked about this before. You You shouldn't necessarily have to engage in a ploy where you say, oh, okay, I'm building a garage. Now it's next to the lot line. Now I'm going to convert it to accessory dwelling unit. Um, however, I don't think that the language maybe is clear enough in uh, 5.9.2B bullet point. One, two, three, four, <laughs> one, two, three, five. four, five. five. Um, I do think that, you know, we could tidy that up somehow to say that um, if su such accessory building is located or is to be located, something simple to just try to, you know, address the concept that, you know, it doesn't have to be pre-existing, that it can be yeah. constructed. I don't know what the best language is for that, but, you know, also in the um, district yard and open space requirements, it's got just above that, it says C.5.4.2B for exceptions. 
You could also include in there plus 5.9.2 as an exception as well and sort of just try to tie it all together. So I, I don't know. I just thought of it from the perspective of somebody who is looking at this for the first time and they started out with the, you know, the yard setback requirements. You might come away not realizing that if you want to build an ADU, you're allowed to do it. And again, mm -hmm. you know, without belaboring the point. So maybe something could be done to tidy up 5.9.2. Okay. Any other thoughts? Mr. Mr. Cunningham has got his hand up. Yep. Mr. Chair, uh, just Please. for a clar clarification on the timeline, the warrant for the 2024 annual town meeting opens on December 8th and closes on January 26th. And I'm happy to serve as a resource uh, for the board on any of the issues discussed tonight or any others. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, so the the ZBA is not allowed to put things on the warrant by itself. We have to go through the ARB or through the select board or, or attend 10 voter signatures. So, um, right. The ARB is the easier way to go. All right. Well, if anybody has any other ideas, uh, let me know. Um, and I still need to touch base with the, the chair of the ARB as to when they want to have this conversation. So Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? We'll figure that one out. Mr. Moore. Thank you. I right. is it, has there ever been consideration by either your board or the ARB, uh, more more likely and appropriately the ARB, a consideration of uh safe harbor guidelines for annual changes to a particular set of regulations and i don't mean zoning as a regulation type i mean specific aspects of the zoning regulation i've noticed that now we're getting annual uh, I, I don't know the annual desires to change mm -hmm. regulations year after year and the town yeah. meeting takes them up and votes them up or down or whatever on a regular basis and i just uh, it might make sense for the ARB to consider some sort of safe harbor guidelines to put that off uh, so it can't happen annually, maybe every other year to reconsider certain things. And I know that's a little bit beyond your purview. So, But this just occurred to me when I, I was thinking of the regulations which guide zoning. This has been a big zoning year, and I'm not sure uh, – where things might have gotten voted down or sideways or whatever that they necessarily should be taken up again next year, maybe the year after or something like that. But just just a thought. I know it's sort of outside the uh, it's outside the box a little bit of what we're talking about. So sorry, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Cunningham, I, my my recollection, and I'd like to know whether Mr. Cunningham agrees with it is. Is that if if an adverse action is taken by town meeting, then it can't come back to town meeting for a certain period of time. I've forgotten exactly what it is, unless the ARB allows it to come back. Is that basically right, Mr. Cunningham? I missed it. I believe it is correct. I think it's two years, Mr. Hanlon. I'm not sure. I'd, I'd want to check that to be sure, but I think there is a a safe harbor. Uh, pursuant to adverse action, they can't be brought up immediately. It might be three years or two. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That sounds like it already is in place. Thank you. Mr. Chair, you're muted. There it goes. All right. Um, thank you for that. So yeah. So if anybody has anything else they want, they think I should discuss with the ARB, just uh, just send me an email. Let me know. Um, so with that, that is everything we had on our agenda for tonight. Um, make sure. Oh, oh, Mr. Chair. 
An additional comment. <laughs> Mr. Moore. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to congratulate Mr. Cunningham on his ascension to the yeah. council seat in a uh, a permanent kind of fashion. And uh, that's all. Just wanted to recognize <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. All right, so we have covered everything on our agenda for tonight. Uh, the next meeting of the board is scheduled for Tuesday, November 28th at 7.30 p.m. Um, we now are down to two items on our docket for that night. Uh, one is the continuation of 212 Pleasant Street, and the other is um, a new hearing for 54 Mary Street. And um, in addition, I'm assuming we will also have a vote on the decision in regards to um, the case we heard this evening on Dorothy Road. Um, so unless there is any other business uh, that anyone on the board would like to bring forward, I'll go ahead and close the meeting. Uh, Mr. Chair, just real quick. The, um, yes. The appeal of the building inspector that was on the, the online agenda, that's no longer on our agenda for the next meeting. So uh, we had talked about this uh, briefly at the start. Um, the the appeal was to the issuance of a building permit of, uh, by another party. Uh, that other party has requested that the building permit be withdrawn. Um, and so we are figuring out exactly how to handle this um, as a matter, but it is our understanding that it will not come before the board on the 28th. That makes sense. Um, okay, so with that, I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank uh, Colleen Ralston and Mike Champa and Michael Cunningham for their assistance in preparing for hosting and assisting us for this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. And it's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So roll call vote of the board to adjourn. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. The board is adjourned. Thank you all very much. I will see you all on the 28th. Happy Thanksgiving, guys. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone.